Right, awesome. Start it in the middle here. Well, you can just use the back button on the remote. Okay. Or yeah, you can do that. Okay. Good morning, everybody. So when I was selecting which lesson I was going to teach, I was kind of hesitant uh, on this one. Uh, for me, sometimes I struggle with loving the people, loving people the way I should. Um, when I was looking through the list, uh, the one about walk not in hate kind of jumped out as me as one that would probably be easier for me to do, but Mark Andrews beat me to that one. Um, <laughs> so. But anyway, it was good. As I, as I went through this, it really, really taught me a lot. And I, I hope that you'll jump in and we can have a discussion and just ask questions. I, I don't want to be up here you know, preaching to you, but uh, like Phil said, we're, we're going to be studying 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. If if somebody could read uh, 7 through 12 for me, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who loves does not he who does not love does not know love, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifest toward us that God has sent <coughs> his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfect in us. By this, we know that we abide in him, and he is, a, he is in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has seen the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he is in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in Love abides in God and God in him. Let us love has been perfect among us in this that we may have bonded in That's good. That's good. We're we're gonna read the whole thing anyway. Where did you stop at? Huh. Which verse did you stop in? Seven. Okay, if somebody else could read uh through 21, that'd be good. 17. For it is not a little made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because that he is so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but the perfect love passes out fear, because fear has so many. He that fear is not made perfect in love. We love him because he loved us first. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is alive. But he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this command have we from him that he who loves God loves his brother also. Okay, thank you. Okay, so John had a special relationship with Jesus. He was referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, John 21 20 says, 
Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who had also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So this is the third time in this in, in 1 John that he has really talked about love. And in the Gospel of John, he, he talks about it over and over again. Um, I think John really understood love. Um, he had a deep understanding of, you know, from being with Jesus and from witnessing, you know, how Jesus acted, uh, how important love was and how love affects not only our relationship with God, but with our neighbors and with the Lord's church. So we're going to talk about those three, those three things. Um, but while we do, I want everyone to think of a situation when someone treated you without love and you know how it made you feel and what happened and on the flip side think of a situation where maybe you didn't treat someone with love and and how you know that made the other person feel and then ultimately how it made you feel all right so how does love affect our relationship with god so where where did love come from God, yeah. So God is the origin of love. And in fact, before man was even created, God loved his son. John 17, 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. All right. And then as we just read in 1 John 4, uh, we love God because he first loved us. All right, so it, God taught us how to love perfectly. Now, there are different types of love. I mean, you, we, we love each, we're supposed to love God and love each other, you know, different than we love our, you know, our best hunting dog or our football team or, or anything else. And that type of love is called agape love. And, it's, and God showed us agape love perfectly through his son, Jesus, and the sacrifice he made. So I thought this was a good definition of agape love. It's characterized by unselfishness and giving, even to the point of sacrifice. It's an unconditional love that doesn't judge based on performance. So it's not something that you earn. It's, it's something that, that when someone puts themselves above you, it... it shows you that type of love. So like I said, it was shown to us by God and demonstrated by the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So Romans 5, 8 says the same thing. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so does God, does God want the type of love where he just commands us to love him and love others and we do it because we have to so what what type of what what type of love does jesus or does god want us to have well, that's right so god he gives us free will we have free will whether or not we you know, follow god believe in god and, and how we act you know he, want, he showed us that perfect type of love through his son Jesus, and that's what he wants us to show him and to others. All right, so how does love affect our relationship with our neighbors? And does anybody want to take a stab at that? Well, first of all, does God really expect us to love everyone? If someone could turn to Matthew 22 and read 36 to 40. These are really the greatest commandment under the law. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like love your neighbor as yourself. Not both the thought of property and property. Okay, thanks, Mark. All right. Then also in John 4 20 to 21, it says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So, so yes, God expects us to love everyone. All right, so, and we just talked about that God wants us to have the type of the love that we want, that, that he showed us, not because he commands us to, but yet here it says, and he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So does this go against what we we're talking about earlier of our own free will? And I don't think so because it says if we love God, we must also love our brother and sister. So it's both. So basically, if we're having trouble loving other people, we're not loving God correctly to begin with. And that's the way that he showed us through Jesus. Okay, here's a question. Are some people easier to love than others? Okay. Okay, why, <laughs> why, why is that? Because they're not with Jesus. That's right. It, this is a tricky situation, but I think the people that agree with us are the easiest to love. And we need to be careful as Christians. The world is trying to redefine hate these days. Hate means we don't agree with Jesus. And that's not what he is. Right. Uh, so if we need to be very careful and be consistent and find out what people really believe. And maybe it's not exactly what we believe, but if we can understand where they're coming from and not assign to it, just to put our numbers or so on it, but us. Absolutely. Yeah, and we are human, so it might be easier for, for me to love someone than it is for someone else and vice versa. I mean, like you say, the people that share our beliefs are typically the the easier people to love but we're not only commanded to love them so we'll come back to that one uh, okay so kind of like what you were talking luke 6 32 if you love those who love you what credit is that to you even sinners love those who love them all right and this, this and as i struggle with loving people the way i should this is kind of something that that, that helps me so we're all sinners, okay? And a lot of the times, I'm the sinner that people are struggling to love. And if I can, and, and if I can remember that, even though I'm a sinner and God loves me in spite of you know my sins, my imperfections, knowing that helps me to love others because a lot of times I'm that person that people will find hard to love. All right. Um, how are some ways? How are some ways that would help us love difficult, difficult people? And Mark touched on it so already. But. Well, I think remembering <clears throat> that God loves us even when we're difficult, even when we're unlovable. God still loves us. If we're going to follow God and have to be like that and be the reflection of God on this earth, we're like little mirrors that are around. We're supposed to reflect God's care and love and work for the others. And we just have to remember God loves us in spite of ourselves. Absolutely. Cool. Well, and another, and Luke, you know, the same similar question is asked about you know, who is my neighbor or the kid that I love. And that's where Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, the religious folks just walk by the guy beating himself for dead. The Samaritan just stops, takes care of him. And his question back to the guy at the end is, well, who was the neighbor? The one who showed compassion. 
It didn't have anything to do with whether the guy was Jew or Gentile, Samaritan, or whatever. It was just he was a person in need. That's right. And he's calling on us to always look for it. Doesn't matter who they are, what they believe, anything else. If they're in need, we reach out to them. And I've always thought it interesting that you know John is the one who becomes you know he's the gospel in his letter and sort of the apostle of love. We forget that it was him and his brother James who came back to Jesus and said, Well, we went and preached to these people in this town and they refused to listen. Should we call down fire from heaven and blow them up? <laughs> that's, that's good. Point. Yeah, they, and they, his nickname was Son of Thunder. Right. <laughs> this was not his natural inclination. That's right. And then I think kind of well, and I know for me, before I became a Christian, it was not my natural nature either. But mm -hmm. but God expects, you know, if we're gonna follow Jesus and become Christians, and He expects us to, to love others, and and it's harder for some people than others. And something else you brought up, it's you know the Samaritan showed love. He did something. He didn't just say, "Hey, I love you," and I keep on walking. It's different saying you love someone versus showing them that you love them. Okay, so how does love affect the Lord's church? Right. Okay. Totally agree. Okay, so as far as the Lord's church goes, all right, I think our love towards God and our neighbors affects not only how people view us, you know, as individual Christians, but as the Lord's church as a whole. Um, how are people, how do people know that we're Christians? Exactly. So John 13, 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So if people see us acting like Jesus did, then they'll they'll want to know more about us and about what, what we believe. Okay, also, uh, can someone please read Philippians 2, 1 through 4? Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Okay. So verses three and four there, that sounds a lot to me like agape love. It says, putting other people's interests ahead of yours. I think that if we show people we love them and they see the church functioning like it describes in Philippians 2, that there's a really good chance they'll want to become a Christian. And, and that's it's what happened to me. So I didn't become a Christian until I was in my you know, mid-20s. Um, I had 
you know, growing up, not really attending any, any type of church regularly. You know, I had gone to the Episcopal church a little bit with my grandmother. Uh, I was exposed to the Catholic church. I went there like to a Catholic school, first to third grade. A um, little bit uh, Presbyterian church here and there. And I, even as a, as a younger kid, I always kind of just, it seemed like they were just doing these things because they had to and out of, you know, a ritual, you know, rituals. And it just didn't, I, didn't, I guess I didn't know what it was back then, but you just didn't really, I guess, feel the love. Um, it wasn't until I met Rochelle that, and they had known her for some time, and I saw how she treated everyone. And I was like, this, this isn't normal. Most people don't act like this. It's certainly not how I grew up. I mean, as human nature is, I grew up hating more things and people than I loved. I mean, and because that's, you know, human nature. And so I just couldn't figure it out. So the first time I met Rochelle's family, I'm like, these, these people are strange. They, you know, they don't, they don't act like other people. They're, I mean, just, you're going somewhere with them. Someone's broken down on the side of the road. They pull over. Hey, can we help you? Can we take you somewhere? Can we get you a hotel for the night? And, that's, and I, I just couldn't figure it out. And when I was growing up, if someone was ever that nice to you, they, they had an angle. They were trying to take advantage of you in some way. And I, I just couldn't understand it. And when I finally realized that the only thing that these people wanted was to teach people about Jesus and, and share the good news, then that was all it took for me. I mean, that's how I became a Christian. So it really does, love is, is key. It really, really does work. All right, can the Lord's church be effective if its members lack love? I think it would be impossible. I don't see how it could be. Okay, and then Rochelle, you know, when I was just had become a Christian, she would say this all the time, speak the truth in love. And I really didn't understand what she was talking about, but basically we can be correct biblically and we can be doing all the right things, but if we don't deliver it to people through love or out of love, they're not going to want to listen to us and find out what the truth is anyway. So Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, instead of speaking the truth in love, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect a mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So to me, this is saying, if we speak the truth in love, we become more like Jesus and, in, and that in turn will build up the, the church. Awesome. Yeah. Scripture supports that holding statement. In Revelation, when Jesus is dictating the letters to the seven churches, it's to the Ephesian church where John is writing this letter as well. That he tells them, you're doctrinally right, but you've lost your love. And if this doesn't change, I will remove your lampstand. Yeah. And that's how serious it is to him. Correct. Right. Anybody else? Okay, so in the beginning, and you don't have to volunteer anything, but we were thinking about a situation where you were treated without love and how it made you feel, or inversely, the time in which you treated someone without love and how did it make you and them feel? Um, I'll go first on the one. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and, and this is, I, you know, this is hard because I've been a Christian probably 15 years, but I still find myself struggling with this. So I have, I have a, you know, I have a neighbor, um, nicest, nicest guy there is, but he just seems to have the most inopportune times to come over and try to, to try to talk to you. So, you know, you might be right in the middle of something, working on your truck, it's jacked up in the air, you're under trying to do something, he's coming over there trying to talk to you, it's like, hey, like, 
just not very aware, you know. And so I've I've been kind of I was kind of short with him, you know, several times. And well, just recently found out that his wife, you know, was diagnosed with cancer and just the nicest lady. And it really made me stop and think. I'm like, how petty of me to not, you know, show show these people more love. And it's it's because of something that I thought was more important at the time. And that's not how we're, we're supposed to act. And it really made me stop and think, you know, and <clears throat> you feel ashamed at first, but then I think that, you know, you just, you just realize you've done something wrong and then you grow from that in the future. Does anybody else have one? Did they want to share? I'm sure it's happening. <laughs> I agree. And then sometimes I have to remind myself, you know, you don't ever know what someone is going through. You know, you know, as a coworker, you don't know what a lot of times what they have going on at home. And that maybe that's why they're treating you the way that they are. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Last question. Are there any other verses or examples from the Bible that that help that help y'all love better. Well, the whole uh, First Corinthians thirteen, right? Uh, chapter uh, and all more good information there. Absolutely, and that could be a reminder too. Sometimes, if you read through that, what you know, what love is, and and you're not. Meeting, or you're not just you know showing those those attributes or those qualities. Then yeah, it could be a reminder. Maybe I'm not really loving correctly. All right. Okay. Another thing that you just brought up nowadays, when you're trying to help someone, you know, I learned this from the church. Yeah. Your own definition of love. You know, you take my body and buy it. You pray. I mean, no, it's not going to do that, but you don't love me. Right. I mean, the more the devil is that too, but it's not the society way of thinking, you know. If you love me, you do this. Or you do that. And I'm not, most of the time, you don't solve the issue. You know, so when you go up and talk to new people come around saying you're hungry and stuff, you say, come on again and take this thing. I want to go to Burger King. Yep. Um, so that's another thing we constantly try to stay on top of too. Come in here. I'm hungry, you're going to eat, you know, but you don't get the other one and stay. Maybe I don't even stay on it. Not to change anything, but that's just the mindset of people walking the street out of town. Yeah, and sometimes it's I think maybe people accept the accept the love you're trying to show them more easily or more quickly than others. Exactly. For other verses that maybe helped me uh, walk in love, I think it's just a simple thing about John three sixteen or the example of Abraham and Isaac when Isaac 
encounter somebody who's very difficult to deal with and think, well, sacrifice, I think, in order to help them out. I think about how, how insignificant that sacrifice has compared to like, some of the biblical examples of true love are. And I, you know, sometimes I find myself doing things that I would not help someone just because of the very minor yeah, absolutely. If you if you compare the sacrifices that we're making to the sacrifice that Jesus or God made by sending His Son to die for us, they're you know fairly insignificant. Exactly right. Yes. Um, and just to build on what Bill said, love is demonstrated through love. Love is demonstrated through love. Love is demonstrated through love. More times than not, we don't mind sacrificing for our new people. We have a certain time of sacrificing. Outside of we don't want to sacrifice our time or money or talent, anything because the next thing we're going to take care of us and our folks first. And then it comes down to sacrifice for all of us. We don't want to do the same. 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 And I think we're all going to do it. To me, that's where love is demonstrated is in the sacrifice because it's key. You know? And just like your example, taking the five minutes out of what you were doing to, to have a conversation. I get it. I mean, we all have those people that you're fighting, to, you know. But I think a lot of times God uses those moments to, every, there is no coincidence. Let's just be honest. The, those moments that we feel that frustration with us, that's God trying to teach us something that we'll stop and take the time and say, okay, there's a lesson here. I think you're exactly right. Yeah, another scripture that, that helps me is of course the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, uh, I think it's 13 through 14. He talks about reaction. In other words, if someone is evil to you, you uh, react in a nice way, evil compared to man. So I think one of, one of the things is something required to go a mile. I think about that the Roman soldier would have a heavy load of gear and he had he had you had the obligation to carry his gear a mile. But if you carried his extra mile, what what he what would he see in you versus uh, you know just there, there's your mile, no gear down. And also the attitude that you demonstrated while you were carrying his gear. So with, without a good attitude, your uh, your extra mile might be lost. So it, it's it's both a uh, it's both a yielding of the sacrifice as well as an attitude. That's right. If you're complaining <laughs> the whole time, you're helping someone. I don't think they're going to feel the love as they would if you. Uh, Miss Denise. <laughs> But then in verse uh, 14, it tells us to do all things without complaining and disputing. Exactly. And then it tells us that if you have, because if by doing this, we will become blameless and harmless and children, uh, children of God without fault in the midst of a crook, 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 uh, crook, crook and perverse generation. So in that, in that we by trying to in this crook generation, they're having to to constantly deal with. I'm having to deal with it every day among my neighbors. So it's hard with me. So I'm having to constantly deal with it. So when I'm having to deal with it. I go to the, I find me all throughout this week, I have gone, gone to the Word of God. And the Word of God has been a very much a comfort to me this week. And, and it, when you go to God, you're finding His answer. That you're finding the perfect example. 
the best answer you could get. Exactly. I mean, even when you're being persecuted, if you could always go to God because He is our friend. Absolutely. All right. I think we're out of time, but thank you all for coming. Well done. Thank you.